then doing predictions on a test set simply amounted to conditioning. So a very basic operation of Gaussians is all you need in order to do nonlinear regression. And um, so that if you have just a few data points, um, like indicated in this picture, we have just a few data points, in this case only five, but despite this, that there's very little data, we're able to come up with a very, with a fit of the data that seems to be very plausible. Not only do we get a nonlinear fit of the data, um, but we also get uh, good confidence, uh, what appear to be good uh, confidence intervals for that data set. In particular, as I've said many times, and I repeat, where there is data, you should be confident. When you don't have data, you shouldn't be confident. Where you don't have data, you should believe only your prior knowledge. Where you have data, you should believe the data. Um, Gaussian processes, um, the key to Gaussian processes is they captured um, our belief that um, a lot of functions in the real world are smooth. Okay, so, and, and indeed, if you look at the space of natural images and sounds in the world, um, you will find that smoothness is a very reasonable assumption. So if the, if, the, if the data that we acquire from the world satisfies this property, then we, we would expect that Gaussian processes will turn out to be a very powerful way of uh, modeling the world. And um, we started going over Gaussian processes when there is no noise. Uh, so to recap, our data set consisted of points and evaluations of a function. Now this function, is in our, it's, it's important to get this, the following thing. The function, all I need to do is evaluate it. I do not need an, a mathematical expression for that function. Okay. If that function could be, for example, um, his preference for different countries in the world. And I could be asking him questions like, do you prefer Brazil to Canada? No. Do you prefer the UK to France? Yes. Do you prefer Korea to Japan? No. And by doing these questions, I will be able to learn a GP that will describe his preference. A GP in this case would be an object that's, I guess, uh, 3D, it's over the globe. And uh, you could map it just like a map to, to D. Um, and that would give his preferences of our countries in the world. So he is the cost function. He is F. I'm asking him, I'm giving him points, i.e., I, I'm giving him countries, or pairs of countries in this case. And then he's returning to me the evaluation of those points. I give him two points, he replies one or zero. One if he prefers the first one, zero if he prefers the second one. So in this sense, um, the function just needs to be evaluated. So GPs are actually very good when you have int uh, intelligent user interfaces, when you want to, to have computers that can interact with humans. If you want to build robots, this turns out to be a very useful tool. There was a question. So in this, uh, like in this case, what's the distance between two countries? That's the Right, so I have not introduced um, very good observations. So the way he, I, he was giving me data was as binary labels. I prefer it to be or B2C. I have not taught you how to do that yet. What I have taught you to do is regression. So let me re re repeat the exercise with what I've given you. On a scale from zero to one, how much do you like Canada? <laughs> On a scale from zero to one, how much do you like Brazil? What? On a scale from zero to one, how much do you like Costa Rica? What? On a scale from zero to one, how much do you like Antarctica? What? He will get the unit function. I can go to hell. On a scale of zero to one, how much do you like North Korea? On a Probability subjective. I've already, we've established that with experiments in this class. Um, so she's giving me different numbers. Um, and his function would not be very interesting. His function would be just uniform. 
nonetheless, it would capture the data. His, his case is really trivial to fit. It's just a line, just need a bias. Uh, her case is a bit more interesting. Earth curve 3 is 0.1, Canada? The US? 0.7. Mexico? 0.5. Hmm, Burundi? <laughs> right, the cost function has noise now. <laughs> um, the, the important thing is the setup here. When I choose a country, I'm just choosing a point in 2D. When she gives me a number in return, she's giving me her subjective evaluation for that point. She's giving me F. I give her XI, she gives me FI, where I is the index of a country's. And just by doing this, I would fit a GP. And I would already learn which country she tends to prefer, you know, whether she prefers Asia, whether she prefers, if, provided that I assume that if countries are nearby, the preferences are similar. That's the sort of hypothesis that I'm using here. Uh, the point being that f is a function that might be in the head of the user. f is not a function that, for which there is a mathematical object that describes it. When I learn to fit a GP, I am learning the mathematical model that describes um, the world or the preferences in your head and so on. So in this case, in the, uh, initially, um, I said that XI, how many people of you have run the code? Okay, those who haven't, do, do it soon because it really maximizes your learning experience to do so. Um, certainly in the next homework you will get to play with it. Um, but, but it does help when I give you code snippets, have a look at them. Take, take the time because it definitely um, makes much more concrete what I'm going over here with sort of dry math. Um, okay, so back to the dry math. If you know the joint distribution of a Gaussian and we have the points F in the training set, arbitrary <coughs> test set points, then computing um, computing predictions is just a question of um, deriving the conditional distribution from the joint, an exercise that we went over in great detail in the last class. So if you know how to go from, um, you use your axis to construct these matrices, which are the matrices of similarities between the training set and the test set, the self-similarities in the training set, which is just K, and the self-similarities in the test set, which is K um, double star. And once you've constructed these matrices of similarities, um, F star is unknown, F is known from your training data, and then the process of prediction is just uh, computing the posterior distribution of F star given F and the previous X, for which there is an analytical expression telling us what the mean is and what the variance is. And so for several points here, several test points, X star, so I, I create a very fine grid of these X star points, and for each X star, I can compute the mean and the variance, and so I can plot it, and it looks like that beautiful plot um, there, where I'm showing you the mean in blue, the true unknown function is in red, so I'm showing you my model seems to capture the world pretty well. And quite importantly, where the model is, doesn't have data, it's very uncertain, and those confidence intervals capture that as well. Since I have a Gaussian distribution for F star, okay, so this is a Gaussian distribution with mean mu star and covariance sigma star, since it's a Gaussian, I can draw samples from a Gaussian. Each sample is a vector, in this case I think of 50 components, and each color that I'm plotting there on the right hand side is one such vector. So each color corresponds to a vector with 50 entries that I've drawn from that Gaussian distribution. And these are essentially the predictions. 
I drew 50, but I could have drawn 50,000. I could have drawn 50 trillion. And the shapes would, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to perceive differences because there's enough resolution there that to fool the eye. Um, I could have an infinite number of points and still be able to do this because indeed a Gaussian process is defined of uh, functions. Um, and what you see that essentially a Gaussian process does is that where there is data, you have all these functions in, in your prior. And what the data does is it just grabs all those functions and squeezes the uncertainty. So your now posterior samples um, look like samples from uh, the posterior distribution. And it makes sense because if you look at these curves, they're, they're curves that would fit inside the gray intervals on the left. Okay. So we did this in detail in the last class and we also looked at the effect of choosing the kernel width. Um, the kernel has parameters. So you can decide whether you want to be similar to things that are only very close by or whether you want to be similar to things that are a bit further away. That's a, but to do that, you essentially change this, um, the variance of the Gaussian, this parameter um, L. And here I'm showing you a few values. If you use an L that is very small, um, so in other words, a very thin kernel, if you use a very thin K, then only points that are nearby are similar to each other. And so you would expect a more wiggly function, which is what we observe when we try. Um, on the other hand, um, so as you can see here, the mean is in red is a very wiggly function. Um, and as we increase L, the function becomes smoother. Okay, it and eventually, if I kept increasing it, it would become actually a straight line. It would become way too smooth. So there's a natural trade-off here. So we have to choose this kernel width. And the simplest way that you already know is cross-validation. So you could use uh, quite reasonably. All right, who's got Skype going in their computer? <laughs> Can I ask you to please turn off all online media in your computers? It is distracting. Thank you. Where was I? Yes, we control the smoothing by controlling this parameter of the kernel. One way to choose this parameter is by doing cross-validation. So, like, like you guys have done before. Go ahead. Which one is the prediction and which one is the true um, I think the, because the true function seems to be the same everywhere. So I think the true function here, it, it, no, I know the true function is blue and the prediction is in red. Because it's now, as you can see, it's the red. The red is more wiggly here. As you can see, it's, it's going up and down, as, uh, whereas the red here tends to be a much more straight uh, function, much smoother. <coughs> so actually, I hope I did. Uh, sorry, just a second. I hope I got it right here. Oh, no, I didn't. So this seems to be the true function. And the other one is the prediction. If you run the code, you will see it for yourselves. So this is the important thing. I gave you the code that does this. So you can go to that code now, and you can, tune, you can play with that parameter in the code. And you can see what happens. And nothing's going to teach you better than for you to go and play with it. And see, OK, if I increase L, what happens if I make L really large? What happens if I make L really small? Um, go and do those experiments, because you will get a lot from doing those experiments. Um, go ahead. In the smallest, um, the one on the left there, that little peak on the red, what's dragging the uh, prediction up like that? Because there's no data points up there. You know, like what's dragging the prediction up? On the red here? Yeah, the little peak in the red. Right there, yeah. Um, I have no idea. It could be just simply because of the nature of the curvature of the function. As it's coming from left and right, <coughs> they both have negative curvature, and that might be what's forcing it. <coughs> One thing I could do with the GP to, to, to get rid of this is I could also force, the if the data consisted of the slopes, not just the function evaluations, 
I could match on the slopes as well and I would get it much smoother. There was another question. Someone, okay, let me move on. Um, like I said, play with the code. And then you can see the effect of this parameter. And then doing cross validation, you can set this parameter. And I'm going to talk to you about a few other ways of how to tune this parameter today. So it would seem, looking at these pictures, that also changing all changes your confidence quite dramatically. So if you, because on the left you have very low yes, confidence. Yes, so yes, it will change your confidence because when you change L, you change K, and both the mean and the variance are functions of K. So it's very important to um, when you change this depending on the objective of the analysis, if you're just looking for mean predictions, then you would do cross-validation. But if you need to model uncertainty, then um, the choice of L is actually quite tricky. And especially in the next class on Thursday, I'm going to come to a case where it is particularly tricky. But for now, imagine that you have lots of data, your purpose is to just fit a function, and that you can do cross-validation because it's the one technique I've taught you so far. And in that setting, you now have a very powerful way of doing function approximation. Okay. Uh, before we get to the more detail on how to learn that parameter of the kernel, um, let's first deal with a few other things that are equally important. Um, the first thing is how to deal with noise. So far, I assume that the function f didn't have noise. But of course, um, sometimes when I ask a question, like when I ask her for a rating on a country like Burundi, that she might not be entirely certain as to how much she would like it because she doesn't know what Burundi looks like, and then there is uncertainty. Um, and if there is uncertainty, you want your model to deal with that uncertainty. So th there would be uncertainty in her reply. And so we need to then acknowledge that uncertainty in one way to do it. Um, if I assume that the data is just ratings and that the noise is Gaussian, um, then I would just add a Gaussian variable to my function evaluation and get a noisy function of evaluation, which I call Y. So Y is the noisy function measurement. In the initial experiment where he was giving me zeros and ones, I would have had to use a Bernoulli model to model that kind of noise. Okay. So if we have um, Gaussian noise, in order to compute the distribution of y given x, I need to integrate over f. I need to marginalize f. Okay, so if we have, if I want p of a and I have p of a and b, I have to sum over b in order to get p of a. That's the basic operation of probability. Uh, whenever you have a variable you want to get rid of it, you need to integrate over it. Uh, we know each of these quantities, like for example, p of f is just the prior, which I said, let's assume that it's zero mean, assuming we have standardized the data, and let k be our similarity kernel, as before. Um, but now we're saying that each data point that I observe uh, will be independent and will have Gaussian noise. Since each point is independent, um, if I have um, n points, I just need to multiply n 1D Gaussian distributions for each point yi that I observe. And if we use the convolution theorem, that is the integral of the product of the Gaussians that we introduced in that in last class, then you'll see that the distribution for y, the noisy function, still has the same mean, um, but its covariance increases. And the increase in covariance, the covariance for y, now includes the covariance of f plus the covariance of sigma squared. If you do not want to use that theorem, I want to think of it that different way. Um, just think of the linear properties of expectation and the linear prop and, and covariance indeed is just an expectation. Um, if you have independent random variables uh, using and 
the linearity of expectation, um, if you want to know the variance of adding two random variables, you just add individual variances. It's a property that follows from linearity. Um, the conclusion being that y will have now covariance ky. So in mapping f, the noise-free function to a noiseless function y, all I'm doing is I'm modifying the kernel so that the kernel now has an extra diagonal entry which corresponds to the noise in the date. The noise observed when I ask a question. Once again, we know how to model. Now that I know what the covariance of y is, it still has mean zero, except that the only new thing is I replaced k by this ky, where ky has this extra um, sigma squared added to the diagonal. And the rest is as before. If you have um, an expression, um, if, you, if we have an expression for the joint distribution of a Gaussian distribution, uh, we just use our theorem to get an expression for the conditional, which includes the mean and the variance. So having Gaussian noise only involves a minor modification of the algorithm, which is the addition of a diagonal term, sigma squared. Everything else is the same. So it's just a very minor modification to account for uncertainty. When you plot this, you however observe that even when you have data, even in the regions where there is data, like here, there is still uncertainty. Before, because we assume no noise, that uncertainty collapsed at the data. Now the uncertainty doesn't collapse at the data because there's always this error we will make. We're assuming we'll always make an error of sigma squared at least um, because that's the uncertainty in the data. However, we still have the same properties as before. Where we have data, we have less uncertainty. Where we don't have data, we have greater uncertainty. Okay. Now, that's essentially all there is to GPs. Um, I think this slide summarizes the whole thing. If you want to fit uh, a GP to data, you just construct a matrix K using the similarity kernel. Um, if you have noise in the data, you just need to add <coughs> sigma, the, the variance of the noise to your diagonal of K. That gives you now your KY matrix. And if you've rescaled the data so that it's zero mean, then the only thing that's left for you to do is code these two equations for mu star and sigma star. And that gives you the predictions on any point x star. So the mean prediction as well as the confidence interval. And we're done. We have a beautiful way of fitting data. So the code is really simple. Um, how can, we, how can we measure the uh, variance of error? Sigma y. Sigma y. How can we measure it? You have to estimate it from data. How do you estimate? Um, exactly. Exactly how you did it in homework one. Maximum likelihood or which prior would you put on sigma? Exactly. And the inverse wish shirt, is one thing I didn't say, is the inverse wish shirt in 1D has a name. It's called the inverse gamma distribution. Okay, so in 1D, the inverse wish shirt distribution, if you plot it, it looks like this. Okay. Pardon? There is a parameter, there are parameters like alpha and sigma and sigma star in inverse ratio. And so you should estimate that, those parameters. Yes, 
the, you still need to uh, choose the parameters of the prior. Th that is correct. So, um, and, and actually that points to a very subtle um, question. Um, I'm choosing, I don't know what my sigma is, so instead I'm going to say that my sigma comes from this distribution and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to um, you know, figure out, uh, I'm going to assume that this is my prior for sigma and then given the data I will readjust this distribution and I will get something different, uh, a posterior for sigma. PL sigma squared given the date. <coughs> the prior has parameters, however. Those parameters are useful because for me, as a designer, I want to be able to tune those parameters to say what are my preferences. I ch I'm choosing the shape of the prior to capture my preferences. However, in some cases, I might not have information that allows me to choose the best shape of the prior. In such cases, you can then put a, another level of inference and actually estimate those parameters. So you try to infer <coughs> those prior parameters directly from the data. That is called maximum likelihood type 2, or as some people call it definite maximization as well. Um, in this course, I've chosen not to go into that, but that's Usually, that's routinely done in practice. Is that related to empirical base? And what does that that's mean? exactly empirical base. Okay. And some people questioned its validity because you're learning the parameters of the, you learn the prior from data, so that seems somewhat wrong. Okay. Uh, it's done in practice uh, quite often. There are smarter ways to do it. Um, the other argument is that what you can do if you're a Bayesian, you can do a, something called hierarchical base. So what you do in hierarchical base is you have uncertainty over a quantity. So what you do is you put a prior on that quantity. Um, so I might not know what my sigma is. And so what I say is that I believe it's in this range with high probability. That's less commitment than to say sigma is 2 or sigma is 1. All you're saying is it's in a range. However, if you do not want to commit to what the, so the next question is, what's that range? It's clear that committing to a range is not as big a commitment as committing to a specific value. And if I do not want to commit to also this range, what I can do is I can be like this. I can put a hyper prior on this. So I believe this guy is on this interval, and I believe the boundaries of the interval are between these values and these values. So you're making your knowledge very diffuse. And what most often people find in practice is if you follow this hierarchical Bayesian modeling strategy, um, the algorithms tend to be fairly insensitive to, toward, with respect to the specification of these parameters, but they tend to be very sensitive with respect to the specification of this parameter. So the idea is you're trying to create an algorithm that when you tune the parameters, uh, you don't want, what you don't want is an algorithm where you just a slight change of the parameter gives you completely different results. If you can come up with a uh, Bayesian hierarchy where you get such that when you tune the parameters, they don't, you know, if you choose 0.1 or 10, the results don't change much, then you have a fairly robust prior. However, when doing this, it's always important to test the hypothesis. It's always important to verify that you indeed have a robust prior. So often I see papers that build a hierarchy but forget to do the experiment to confirm that their prior is indeed insensitive. And so the, it's important to do sensitivity analysis. Um, for now, we will assume that we specify the prior, that we have good knowledge in specifying the prior. For your project, of course, uh, you will likely do things like empirical base and maximum likelihood of type 2, because that's what people do in practice. Okay. In fact, I'm putting a prior of a function, and I'm saying that I don't know what L is, the, the, you know, the width of the similarity kernel. So as such, that width of the similarity kernel is kind of taking me one level 
in the hierarchy. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to describe an algorithm for choosing that width. In, in a sense, uh, I'm doing maximum likelihood type 2, so I'm doing empirical base. Before I get there though, um, actually that comes, that, let me jump over a few slides since we're discussing this, I will go straight to that. Um, I'll come back to the other stuff that I wanted to, to do, but just to continue answering your question. Suppose I want to learn the kernel parameters, so one way to do it is cross-validation. Um, and then to learn small sigma y, I would just do, I could do cross-validation or I could do maximum likelihood or I could do Bayesian learning. So you start realizing that there's more, one, more than one way to do this. What I could also do uh, in order to learn the kernel parameters is the following. I could try to write the likelihood. Now the likelihood is just uh, the probability of y given x. And this quantity here, it's actually called the marginal likelihood. In this model, I have a latent variable, which is f, or a hidden variable called f. And so I need to get rid of its effect in the choice of um, the likelihood. So in order to get a probability of y given x, I need to, um, and I should emphasize an L squared where L squared is my parameter, I need to integrate out f. Now to integrate out f, once again I use the rules of probability. Um, that gives me a Gaussian that's zero mean and covariance ky. I can then compute the log likelihood, or the log marginal likelihood, which is this expression. And then k has parameters. Um, in this case, my parameter was just L. And if k has parameters, then in, when I compute the derivative of the log likelihood, I just need to compute the derivative with respect to each of the parameters of k. Okay. So in other words, I can do maximum likelihood to learn L, which is effectively what I'm doing here. Now, P of F is a prior, and now I'm learning the parameters of the prior, which is the width of the prior. So in that sense, I'm from data. So in that sense, I'm doing this. Um, I'm following this procedure that people refer to as empirical base. And the empirical because we're using experiment to learn the prior. Now, I have not taught you yet how to do optimization. Those of you who know how to do optimization for, will see this as trivial now. Because all you have, you have an expression for the gradient. If you follow the gradient, you will be able to get, get a good estimate of theta. Um, if you haven't seen optimization, then wait a few lectures and we will cover optimization and once you learn optimization you'll be able to learn, be able to actually um, implement this and be able to learn the optimal theta by maximum likelihood. Okay, but let's go back um, again to Gaussian processes. And what I want to do next is I want to derive Gaussian processes from a different perspective. Okay. And hopefully by deriving it from a different perspective, it will connect Gaussian processes to what you learned when you did the linear models. And it will connect it with homework one. And hopefully will give you more insight into why these methods work so well. Okay, so let's assume we have a single test point, x star. So we have a single test input x star. So then the, the prediction of f, which in this case is 1 by 1, um, is just given by uh, this Gaussian here, which has mean k star ky inverse times y, and it has the covariance that appears in the second argument of the Gaussian. In this case, because we only have a point, k 
case star star is just a scalar. And in fact, if we use the similarity kernel that I've been using, which is the exponential, it's just one, right? Because e to the e to x star minus x star is just e to the zero, and e to the zero is one. Um, this will be a vector of size 1 by n, and then the matrix ky is a matrix of size n by n, as before. But now, these quantities here, ky and y, are from the training data. Okay, the, the y was the vector of answers that she gave me, and ky was the matrix that I built uh, using the axis that I used um, to question her. And so all this comes from the training. I can now take this expression for the mean, okay, just the, the expression for the mean. And instead of writing it in vector, uh, matrix vector notation, um, recall this is 1 by n. This is n by n, this is n by, and then y is n by 1. Um, so, and of course the whole thing is 1 by 1 because it's just a mean for a single point. I can then, re by calling this, so this k inverse y is what I'm going to call alpha, and that's a vector that's n by 1. Right, using the basic properties of matrix multiplication. Um, if alpha, if then what I'm left with is the multiplication of k star transpose times alpha. Okay, a vector times a vector, just a dot product. Now, a vector times a vector, I can rewrite it in component-wise and this way. Okay, so each alpha now appears as multiplying a kernel. What does this remind you of that we've seen in this course? Nothing? RBF. An RBF. This is just the equation of an RBF. An RBF was a linear combination of basis functions. This is a linear combination of basis functions because each k is a basis function. Each of these guys can be written as the sum of i, of i e to the minus 1 over lambda x i minus x star squared. So that's precisely an RBF. <coughs> and in an RBF, wherever there is data, we place a basis function. We scale the basis function with alpha. And so when I fit a function, I will get a function that will look like this. Okay. That function being this f. It's a sum of basis functions. Each basis function scaled by alpha. So each alpha i is just a real number that scales the basis function. And so a Gaussian process, if you look at the mean, what you're doing is you're just fitting an RBF. You're just fitting a nonlinear function using a combination of basis functions where you've placed each basis function at the data. So one basis function per data point, and then you just add them up. Okay. So it's a, it's a completely alternative way to arrive at the the same result that we had before, but now at least we know that putting the basis function where the data is, is the principled thing to do.
Let's look at something even simpler where a Gaussian process arose, ridge, ridge regression. So recall that in ridge regression, um, it's a linear model, so y equal x theta, just the equation of a, a line or a plane. And we put a regularizer on theta because we prefer smaller thetas. As you saw in your homework, by using this regularizer, you get better answers. Um, the solution by differentiating that objective function and equating to zero was given by um, these equations. And here I remind you that X is a matrix that's N by D. N is the number of data. D is the number of features. Y is the outputs, which is in this case, there's N outputs, N by one. So the matrix X, I can write it as X1, X2, all the way up to Xn, where each row, Xi, is a vector of 1 by D entries. Okay, so each X is one of the rows in this matrix. The matrix is N by D, each of the rows with D entries is one of these vectors that I'm calling small x. In your homework, you had to prove the following thing. You had to prove that the parameter theta could be alternatively be written as x transpose alpha, where alpha is the, becomes the unknown. So this is a reparameterization of the solution. Um, where in, in doing so, you had to prove that alpha was equal to this quantity. Um, that's fairly easy to do, because if we go back to the rich solution, we have x transpose x theta plus delta squared theta is equal to x transpose y, from which delta squared theta is equal to x transpose y minus x theta. And hence the result follows. Theta is equal to x transpose delta minus 2, because delta is a scalar, times y minus x theta. In other words, x transpose alpha. Okay. So that was the first thing you had to do, rewrite alpha this way. Moreover, once you write alpha this way, that is, once we know that alpha is given by this expression, we went further and we said that alpha could indeed be written in this form. And to do that, we again would just go back to this expression and we know that delta squared alpha is equal to y minus x theta. But we know that theta as before is just x transpose alpha, big X transpose alpha. Okay, and so let's do that. And so now I apply the same trick that I did, but sort of in the inverse direction. And I can just say that x, x transpose alpha plus delta squared, and I can just put an identity here, of size n, because it doesn't change. Multiplying a vector times identities just gives you the same vector. Is equal to y. In other words, alpha is equal to x, x transpose plus delta squared i n minus 1 y. So what we have is two different ways of writing the solution for ridge regression. In the first way, we use a parameter theta, that is d by 1. In the second way, we use a parameter alpha, that is n by 1. Or, sorry, I was using small n here. Small n by 1. Now, which one you use 
largely depends on how big is your N, how big is your D. If you have um, an example like bioinformatics, it might be that your N is 20, you have 20 patients, but for each patient you have 20,000 features, uh, which could be uh, how much each gene is manifest. Um, so in that case, it would make much more sense to parametrize in terms of alpha because this matrix that you have to invert would be n by n, which is 20 by 20, is easy to invert. If you, however, were to use this matrix here and consequently use theta, you would have to invert a matrix that is 20,000 by 20,000. Okay, so depending on which one is bigger, D or alpha, you would use one of the different uh, solutions. So this is an incredibly useful trick. Computationally, when you come across tricks that allow you to knock your computation from, especially in this case, in, in the inverses are n cubed to compute. And so if you have to go from 20,000 cube operations to 20 cube operations, that's a huge gain. That's, you couldn't just go and buy computers to get that gain. Because the computers don't grow in power cubically. Um, so it's, it's really useful to know these tricks. In addition, this trick allows us to get close, bring rate regression close to Gaussian processes. Let's see why. So here I should add that the prediction y star for a new input x star would be just um, x star times theta, the usual prediction. Okay. Or using the expression that we have for theta, we could write this as x star times x transpose alpha. So there's two ways to make the, pr the predictions. Either you use theta or you use alpha, depending on which is easier to compute. Now, if the prediction for a new point is x times theta, or equivalently x star times x transpose alpha, or equivalently x star times x transpose times and now I'm using, I'm going to use the estimator of alpha, which is this equation here. Okay. And moreover, if we recall the definitions of these matrices X, so X is equal to x1, x2, all the way up to xn, so that x, x transpose is equal to x1 all the way to xn times x1 transpose all the way up to xn transpose, which is equal to a matrix so it's an outer product of vectors where each entry now is x1 times x1 transpose and so on. Okay. Now recall that each of these vectors, each of the x's is the entries. So this vector here is 1 by d. x1 is 1 by d and so is x2 and xn. So, each, so um, x is a matrix and what I'm using as small x's are the rows of the matrix. So they're vectors, the row vectors of the entries. So what I have here is a row vector of d entries times a row vector of d entries. It's the dot product so each entry in this matrix, which I'm calling x times x transpose, which is of size, um, so this was n by d, 
this is d by n, so this matrix is of size n by n. This matrix is as big as the number of um, data points that you have in your training set, and each entry of these matrices is the dot product between xi and xj. Now, the dot product before, in, in the last class, um, I argued could be interpreted as a measure of similarity. If two vectors are very similar, their dot product is high. If the vectors are very dissimilar, the dot product is low. So dot products are a measure of similarity. In other words, this is a kernel matrix. Instead of using the exponential kernel, I'm now using a linear kernel or the dot product kernel. Using that, I can just rewrite this whole thing this way. We had added a delta square, so let's call this k. In other words, the dual form of ridge regression is a GP. Ridge regression in the dual form is a GP where you have uh, at least the mean is a, the mean uh, of the GP uh, is what we've proved. We haven't talked about the variance. I'm not going to go into that part, but it's, uh, the derivation is similar. Um, so we've proved that the mean of the GP is in fact um, the same thing as what you get when you do uh, ridge regression in its dual form. And where the similarity kernel in this case is just a dot product. We use dot products to measure similarity. And it makes sense because a dot product is just the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the cosine between them. If two vectors are similar, their cosine just is as small. If they're very dissimilar, then you get a big difference in, in, cos in, in the cosine. And yeah, so rich regression is a GP. That's another way to look at it. So there's many ways to arrive at Gaussian processes. I like the probabilistic way of getting to Gaussian processes because I think it's very simple. Uh, provided that you know what a Gaussian distribution is, it's really trivial to just apply one theorem of Gaussian to get the predictions. And um, that gives you a good understanding. Um, but, it, it, but also, um, knowing how one can arrive at the Gaussian process through function arguments is useful. Another way to arrive at Gaussian processes that some folks use out there is if you take a, we haven't done this yet, but for those of you who've seen neural networks before, if you take a one hidden layer neural network and you let the number of neurons go to infinity, you can show that that leads to a Gaussian process as well. Do you need infinite neurons or just one neuron per data point? Uh, infinite number of neurons. Mm -hmm. okay. I can point you to a reference for the construction. So David Mackay, uh, professor in Cambridge, has a nice tutorial where he showed this. Where he shows this was sort of uh, non-rigorously, but you know he has a very nice intuitive way of explaining it. There was another question. The delta squared term uh, that just serves to make data points similar, far away data points similar to each other. Um, in, in this case, the delta square term is just doing regularization. Um, so the delta square term we introduced is the delta square term that we used in rich regression. That was for penalizing parameters being too large. Does it end up serving? So it's just smoothing um, your function. Add the, the k Pardon? Does it do the same thing as sigma squared y, delta squared? Um, not quite. Sigma squared is a parameter. So, so the two are related because this thing here is what I'm calling ky. Yeah. 
right ky inverse is just this whole thing inverse and this is what I'm calling k star and to be a bit more clear um, k star transpose in this case would be a vector and it would have the dot product of um, x, uh, x star where x star is a scalar this is uh, sorry it's 1 by d sorry. Uh, 1 by d and this is d by 1 um, the prediction is a scalar so I would have x star times um, x1 and here x star is a row vector x1 transpose a column vector and then this would be x star times x2 transpose would be the next component all the way up to x star times x and transpose and of course this is of size 1 by n okay because each entry is the multiplication of two vectors which is itself a scale so um, choosing delta will affect what my ky is and hence will affect what my mean prediction is it will also affect what my variance prediction is so it, it does control smoothness so I have two parameters to control smoothness the, the kernel width and um, also delta and in addition I also have the variance of the noise sigma y to play with just that it seems that uh, delta squared is playing the same role as assuming that your input data is noisy. Oh, wait, I see, I see what you're saying. Yes, that is that, uh, that is true. Um, uh, that's very true. When I introduced, um, when I introduced here the sigma, um, indeed, indeed, I will, now, I, now I understand your question. Yes, when we model the noisy data, our trick to model noisy data was to introduce the sigma squared, and then the way it gets mirrored, it gets mirrored to just um, um, it gets mirrored to just adding a diagonal term to that diagonal. When I'm doing the mapping from rich regression, um, I end up with this delta square, which is indeed just like equivalent, the same as sigma y. Yeah except here it has a slightly different interpretation it was a trade-off but uh, in terms of um, their functionality they're the same parameter in the code so it'd be the same quantity so yes so you would have to tune delta squared and you would have to tune the you have to tune the width of the kernel or any other parameters that the kernel may have and how you tune that if you have only two parameters cross-validation does the trick Provided, again, cross-validation only works when you have enough data, when you have lots of data. Um, you could do maximum likelihood, but maximum likelihood also is only efficient when you have lots of data. Um, so, paucity of data causes problems. There's Bayesian ways to deal with this, but they require techniques that we haven't discussed yet in the course. So I'll delay that. So, since delta squared is similar to sigma y, does that mean having noise in your data serves as a regularizer? Design? Yes, precisely. So, and that we will use as the, pr that's basically the principle of uh, technique that we will look later called dropout nets. So rich regression is also called Tikhonov regularization. And Chris Bishop has a nice paper actually called Tikhonov regularization is equivalent um, to adding noise to your data. And people will exploit this to construct algorithms. In some crazy ways, delta squared, if we found that value by cross-validation, is it an estimator for sigma, like for the variance of your measurements? Like, for example, in the prostate data we did, right? We found delta. Mm -hmm. Would that value of delta be a good estimate for the variance of, our, of the measurements we made in the prostate? Data? In this case, in the GP, yes. with this interpretation in the dual space. Okay, so the only thing um, left is how we implement this 
And if you look at, the, well, implementation is really trivial. It's that short snippet of code that it's on, that's available on the course website. So I recommend you go to the course website and download it. Uh, uh, these slides are also there. Um, I will upload them with the changes I've made today. Um, but there in the code, the only other subtle thing you needed to know in order to understand it is when we compute the mean, instead of just inverting k, we instead do a Kolesky decomposition of k and then solve uh, a couple of linear systems. And that's equivalent to inverting k. It's just a bit more stable. And there's many other ways to do this. Um, this one is good because there are lots of very good algorithms for inverting linear systems. Conjugate gradients is one that you could use in this um, case. Um, inverting a linear system is n cube. If you use conjugate gradients, you usually can get very good answers in just a few iterations. And the cost is just a few iterations times n squared. So you, you reduce your cost by a factor of n. And reducing a cost by a factor of n uh, is what determines whether an algorithm gets deployed um, in the web setting or not. Lots of algorithms, when you work in a live search engine, um, and this has happened to me many times working with large data sets, that if the algorithm is n cubed and there's no obvious way to reduce it to n squared, we abandon the idea, even if we think the idea is a good one, just because we do not have the computing power. And buying machines and clouds will not solve that problem. Um, so in this case, by going to a linear system with conjugate gradients, it's possible to knock it down to a few iterations times n squared. And then it's possible to do a few more tricks to make it even faster. And, but that's pretty much what a Gaussian process is. So essentially that snippet of code summarizes how to do Gaussian process and regression. What I haven't told you yet is how to deal with classification. How to deal with the fact that sometimes the labels are binary. Or preferences, for example, when I said you prefer this country to this country. And so if, we, if you're comparing items, then the data is discrete. And, and there we're going to have to do a bit more work than in regression. So it gets a bit more, the math is a bit more involved. Um, but to get there, I will first go and teach you um, what classification is and teach you some more basic techniques for classification. And then if time permits at the end of the course, I will discuss classification with Gaussian processes. Um, however, the textbook of Kevin Murphy does go immediately into classification after this point. And so if, you read, if you're interested in quickly knowing how to do classification with Gaussian processes, I refer you to the book. And if you have questions, office hours. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to use Gaussian processes, mainly because they're very good estimators of the variance, in order to do active learning. In other words, we'll have learning machines that ask questions. Um, those are the most common learning machines deployed uh, at present. Um, if you think about it, every time you get an ad in Facebook, that's a question that's being asked of you. Do you like this ad? And you decide whether you like it or not by clicking on it or not clicking it. Um, when you do a Google search for an image, a bunch of images appear. And whether you click on these images or which order you click on the images, you're sending to Google your vote as to which order you think these images should be in. And even if Google started with a very bad image search, if you typed cat and the, third, the first two images were not cat, but the third image was cat, you would likely click on that image. And by doing that, you would have been sending Google information on what an image of a cat is. So even if Google was not able to do object recognition, Google would have learned how to build an image search engine just by relying on your votes. Um, speech recognition is another example where you continue, you're continuously providing data to people who build recognition systems. So um, active learning is a big part of machine learning on the web. Um, 
and it's a huge part of the whole advertising uh, engine out there. One of you know the reason, sadly, why machine learning is so popular because um, advertising. All right, so in the next lecture, um, I'm going to go over how you can use uh, Bayesian optimization to build um, systems that ask questions. And I'm going to, for the remainder of this lecture, what I'll do is I'll play a video giving you an example of one of such applications built using Gaussian processes. I, in the Google group, I shared with you um, a couple of links. One link is a tutorial on Bayesian optimization, which if you want to prepare yourselves for the next class, I strongly recommend you go and read it, because it already contains the, you've already done Gaussian processes, so you'll find that paper quite easy to read. Um, there's also recently, I saw this blog entry on how Google, were, um, by Steve Scott on Google and multi-armed bandits. And I'm going to cover that in the next class because it's very similar to the problem that we're dealing with here with Gaussian processes. So I recommend those links you know, if you get a chance to look at them. Okay, so I'd like to end the class with um, showing a project of how you could build an interactive interface to assist animators by using Gaussian processes. Um, in a nutshell, uh, we humans are very good at looking at an animated movie and being able to tell whether that dinosaur has a nice walk, whether that dinosaur actually walks like Brad Pitt. We very easily can tell that. You know, if, if you know how well Brad Pitt walks, you can play a movie of Brad Pitt, you can see the, uh, the dinosaur walking and then you can say, no, it, that walk is not like the walk of Brad Pitt or yes. It, most of humans are very good at doing that. Certainly you're very good at going to an animated movie and saying, yes, the animation was good or not good. What's incredibly hard, and those of you who do animation here will agree, is to come up with the mathematical models that make the dinosaur walks, walk like Brad Pitt. That's incredibly hard. You have to come up with a mathematical, never mind that works like Brad Pitt. Come up with a, a, a mo mathematical model that governs how a human walk. It's incredibly complex. So there are these problems for which engineering the cost function is extremely hard, but for which it's possible to get good evaluations. So I could show a movie of a dinosaur and in order to produce a movie of a dinosaur, I need to tune my parameters of my simulator. I show him the movie and ask him, on a scale of zero to one, how good a walk is this? And he gives me a rating. And then essentially I've given him a point. He's given me an F, an evaluation for that point. So I'm learning what basically the the function in his head as to what a good walk is. And I keep trying different walks. Now let's look at this walk. And I ask him, how much do you rate that walk? He gives me a rating. And I keep doing this. And eventually, what I will learn is a function as to what that describes what he thinks is a good walk. And in other words, I would have tuned my engine so that you're actually uh, dealing with the user. Of course, different users will like different walks, so this would be personalized. Here is a, an exercise on building such a system. The computer graphics field is filled with applications that require the setting of tricky parameters. In many cases, the models are complex and the parameters unintuitive for non-experts. We present a machine learning method for setting parameters for a procedural fluid animation system. It uses a gallery of animations and collects Actually, let me start this again because this video is actually crashed. The audio is coming, but not the... Uh... Let's try one more time. The computer graphics field is filled with applications that require the setting of tricky parameters. 
In many cases, the models are complex and the parameters unintuitive for non-experts. We present a machine learning method for setting parameters for a procedural fluid animation system. It uses a gallery of animations and collects user feedback to find... Sorry, <laughs> I was just making sure that it would. <laughs> ...parameters the user likes. We apply our method to generating smoke animation, which drives a set of passive marker particles through a procedurally generated velocity field. This velocity field is generated by taking the curl of a vector-valued potential function. There are two main components to this potential field, the contribution due to a set of vortex rings and a spatially varying noise function. In total, the model requires the tuning of between 6 and 12 real-valued parameters. Generating high-quality renderings is expensive. Fortunately, we can quickly generate low-resolution animations in seconds. This allows the user to find the desired settings and then generate a high-quality animation clip. Different parameter settings can be used to produce a variety of distinctive animations. However, finding the right values to generate a specific animation is difficult, especially for non-experts. Our solution is to use techniques from machine learning to present the user with an animation gallery. At each iteration of the gallery, the user is shown four animations, which they rate by indicating preference for animations that look more like their target. By using preferences, we reduce the cognitive effort required to evaluate the animations, though users can also directly assign numerical ratings to the animations if desired. When the user completes the task of entering preference feedback, the model of the user's interest is updated, and four new sets of parameters are automatically selected. In selecting the examples, the system automatically evaluates the trade-off between two competing goals, trying to offer improvement on the animations the user is known to like, and exploring regions of the parameter space for which the user's preference is unknown. It is not our intention to supplant user expertise, but to use it more efficiently. In reality, users are unlikely to come to the system with absolutely no idea of what parameter values they are looking for. Even novices, after looking at a few samples, can quickly realize that certain parameter values are unsuitable. Furthermore, even when using feedback efficiently, exploring the entirety of a high-dimensional space to a reasonable sample density is a tedious activity. Our interface allows users to restrict the ranges of any or all of the parameters or fix them at a specific value. These techniques work well for a few parameters, but as the number of free same space. Right, so I'm going to move on toward the end. Or as frequent. The more it is used, the more accurate the priors become. It is even possible to adapt to different users or groups by using different priors, creating tools that are automatically personalized to different requirements. Important, like in this case, what you have is a way of generating smoke. There's very tricky parameters. And so what the system does is the system picks some parameters. That's the X. The system then gives that X to the animator by presenting it in a nice UI. And then the animator does, gives a rating. The animator, in this case, being the user. The rating is the function evaluation, the F. And so you collect data like this, and you fit the GP, and then in the video, um, uh, the lady discusses this trade-off between trying to show things that are very close to the ones that he liked best, and also exploring different areas of the state space. Um, in order to exploit, we use the mean. Where the mean is high, we know that that's where good values are. Where there is uncertainty, where the variance is large, that's where we should choose points in order to explore. So by having Gaussian processes, we'll be able to have a very nice mechanism for trading off exploitation and exploration, which is one of the fundamental problems in AI. <coughs> um, it's sort of very key to, 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 to doing progress. Um, I think one of the central problems, um, if you want to make progress in AI, is to nail this down. Um, in the simple case, it's possible to tune, to automatically tune the system to do um, a certain kind of animation. Now, this is far more general than just animation. Whenever you have a system that has parameters, and those parameters have no mathematical model that allows you to tune them easily, and computer science is full of it. Ad centers have parameters 
that people tune by hand. Optimize, you know, uh, compilers. It's another big area where people spend a lot of effort tuning parameters. If we have a way of trying some parameters and build a function like a GP function that tells us what are good parameters, we will be able to optimize compilers, add centers, information extraction architectures in language, um, computer vision algorithms, um, interfaces, and I could go on. Um, at, at UBC we have a lot of people who work on this actually and I'm discussing this now already for research projects. Um, Holger Hus and uh, Kevin Leighton Brown have been pushing this uh, uh, idea not using Gaussian process but using random forests which we will discuss uh, next week um, which are very similar that would allow you to do similar things um, and they've been exploring this idea to indeed tune algorithms automatically and they've had incredible success. Um, in fact, Holder has gone beyond this and says it's not just a question of tuning parameters, but in fact when you wrote, write code and you introduce all these choices, um, you should make those choices explicit and have an algorithm that will make those choices intelligently for you. Okay, so this is very critical to work increased automation in society. If we have, want to have systems that uh, will tune interfaces for us automatically, um, systems, code, etc., um, this is sort of one of the important building blocks uh, toward it. The challenge will be able, um, I think in the video it was mentioned there were just a few parameters. One of the, there's many challenges, one of them being doing this well for very high dimensions. Um, there's been a lot of progress in that recently, um, so this right now is still an area of research. It's very new, it's very hot. Um, there'll be lots of course projects uh, about Bayesian optimization, I imagine. Um, certainly if you come to office hours, I'm happy to discuss some of these with you. And hopefully we've, we've covered the techniques early enough that we can get started with the projects if you already want to explore this further. All right, um, so on Tuesday, on Thursday, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over how to use